So I just finished a book. It's called The Guns of the South, and it asks one of the greatest questions of American history. What would happen if the South had won the Civil War by getting a bunch of AK-47s from time-traveling neo-Nazis? It's a bonkers premise, but what's even weirder is that the Confederacy in this book are considered the good guys of the Civil War. But even weirder still is that when this book came out in the 90s, it wasn't this piece of southern alt-right propaganda. It was just a normal book by a normal best-selling author. His name is Harry Turtlelove. He's from California. He's not some proud boy's weirdo. So I'm going to talk about this random book from the 90s that doesn't hold up at all and how it can help us, or at least me, understand the Confederate sympathizers of 2020, people who want to protect the statues and have Confederate flag truck nuts. And anyway, I'm drinking Jack Daniels whiskey. Uh, here's a numbered list. Part one, the plot. So what happens is it's 1864 and Robert E. Lee just got his ass kicked at Gettysburg when he's visited one day by some strange accented fellows outfitted in modern army fatigues that show him an astonishing new rifle. It's called the AK-47. And he and his buddies are from a group called America Will Break. They have a logo that's obviously derived from the swastika and the reader recognizes them immediately as pro-apartheid South African neo-Nazis. They eventually tell Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, and a few others that they come from the distant year of 2014. They've stolen a time machine, which can only travel backwards and forwards exactly 150 years. Which, first of all, is sort of funny, because 150 years is obviously an arbitrary number that was made by design, which means the only thing keeping the neo-Nazis from going back to, like, World War II or ancient Rome is that they can't change the factory settings Maybe they're worried about voiding the warranty. Anyway, they tell General Lee about a horrible future in which the South is ruined, the slaves are forcibly freed, and the nation is in utter turmoil with blacks and whites at constant war. So this is meant to be an obvious lie from the neo-Nazis, and that's a little weird reading this in 2020, but that's how Harry Turtledove presents it. It's fake news. <laughs> The neo-Nazis sell the South like 150 AK-47s and ammo and freeze-dried meals because they're starving. The South, as you might expect, beat the Union like a red-headed stepchild. The first major battle we see is the Battle of the Wilderness, which in real life was a decisive move for the Union. But now the rebels who are wielding a bunch of AK-47s have a total bloodbath. We see it from the perspective of the novel's other main character, a foot soldier named Nathan Caudell. He's um, like a low-ranking CEO. CEO? NCO. He's a low-ranking NCO. He's a sergeant or something. Uh, he's a school teacher in peacetime. He's basically Tom Hanks from Saving Private Ryan, and he leads this motley crew of rebels. One of them is a former prostitute in disguise. One of them is a slave who's been informally co-opted as a soldier and is now one of their buddies. It's just a fun, motley bunch of lads fighting for the continuation of slavery. Pretty quickly, they take over Washington, D.C. They capture Abraham Lincoln and force a peace. The South has won the war. Robert E. Lee runs for president, and the rest of the book is mostly alternate history nation building. Now, through this whole process, both Robert E. Lee at the top level and school teacher Nathan Tom Hanks on the ground have second thoughts about slavery. Both of them constantly reflect in their internal monologues how their main priority isn't slavery at all, but the freedom of their nation. And Robert E. Lee chooses not to own any slaves. And when he hears reports of slaves serving in the Union Army or rising up to fight the Confederates, he thinks to himself, hmm, these slaves aren't dumb, docile people at all, but real humans who will fight and die for their freedom, just like us. And he gradually becomes a closet abolitionist. School teacher Tom Hanks Nathan has a similar journey. It starts with him fighting against black soldiers in the Union Army and seeing how brave they are. It also comes from watching what the neo-Nazis do. So this whole time, the neo-Nazi guys, I guess there's like a hundred of them, they, they have picked a one-horse town to set up shop in. It's a place called Rivington, North Carolina. And they try to live out their like white supremacist fantasies. They just buy a bunch of slaves and build big mansions and outfit them with air conditioning and electricity and stuff. They also have a headquarters in Richmond, which is the Confederate capital. It's like Washington, D.C., but of the Confederate... I'm sorry, you guys know what a capital is? And only a couple of people know that they're time travelers. To school teacher Tom Hanks Nathan and everyone else, they're just some odd fellows from North Carolina who wear funny clothes and 
make amazing rifles. I mean, honestly, that that might be the most unbelievable thing about this book is that a bunch of obviously foreign men with thick, obviously foreign accents could show up out of nowhere with never before seen technology and go, ah, the assassin is just like you. And everyone's just like, hmm. I can't do a South African accent, so I just did German. These uh, Rivington racist neo-Nazi guys uh, are so racist and cruel that even the slave-owning Southerners are like, bro. And school teacher Nathan is like, I don't know, watching these guys is making me rethink this whole racism thing. And he starts to make black friends and he sees freed slaves. Robert E. Lee, too, starts to plan his abolitionist agenda, which is hard because the Confederate constitution, as it did in real life, protects the right to own slaves, and specifically black slaves. But Robert E. Lee uses some loopholes to draft a bill that will gradually eliminate slavery by uh, ha having the state buy them back and making the children of slaves free after a certain point and stuff like that. See? Robert E. Lee's a good guy. The fact that the main Confederate faction even entertains this is a stretch, but the South African neo-Nazi guys do not like this at all, and they try to sabotage Robert E. Lee's uh, presidential campaign. They, they they fund his main political opponent, who is Nathan Bedford Forrest, a notoriously brutal Confederate general and the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And he's obviously meant to give the reader, like, a clear example of the bad sort of Southerner. Like Nathan Bedford Forrest and Lee have this scene where they sit down to dinner and, and they yell at each other. Forrest is like, Robert E. Lee, you are not racist enough. And Lee's like, you, sir, are too racist. Get out of my house, you racist rapscallion. And Forrest is like, I shall never darken your not racist door again, you unracist. And then there's an author's footnote where Harry Turtle Dove is like, see you guys? See? Just kidding about that last part. Anyway, it all comes to a head when schoolteacher Nathan and his war buddy slash, slash love interest, remember that prostitute in disguise? They, they, they come across one of the neo-Nazis books from the future. It's a history book of the American Civil War and they learn the secret. The Rivington men are not Southern after all. So they deliver this book to President Lee and he reads it and he sees how things would have gone. He sees that Lincoln wasn't a bad guy after all, that the neo-Nazis lied. 2014 isn't fraught with racial violence. It's it's just great in 2014. He confronts the neo-Nazi leader about it and he says, y'all don't care about the South at all. Y'all just care about being big old racist meanies. And the neo-Nazi leaders threaten Lee some more and eventually they try to assassinate him. And this is where we see that they go from racists to all of a sudden really dumb racists because they send a hit squad with Uzis to Lee's presidential inauguration and they try to gun him down on the stage, but Lee's hat blows off or something and he bends down to pick it up just as they start firing and they, they miss, but the gun, but they gun down a bunch of other people, including his wheelchair bound wife, Mary Anna Custis. Lee. So let's take a pause to reflect here. This is a story where the beginning of the final act is marked by Robert E. Lee's wheelchair-bound wife getting gunned down by South African time travelers with Uzis. Oh my god. So of course the guards, which remember have their own AK-47s, kill the neo-Nazi gunmen and then the army invades the Richmond neo-Nazi headquarters, which is across the street or something, and I guess a lot of the neo-Nazis are just kind of hanging out there. I mean, guys, e even if you kill the president, like, what did you think was going to happen here? I mean, Anyway, the Southern Army then marches on the neo-Nazi town of Rivington, and the, the climax is this big trench battle between Southerners with AK-47s and dug-in neo-Nazis with 50 cal machine gun nests, modern artillery, and landmines. And it's actually kind of cool, but for, for some reason, they, they don't try to escape back to the future until it's too late. So the Southerners manage to destroy their time machine. Mean... While they search the neo-Nazi headquarters in Richmond and they find a whole bunch of future history books. And Robert E. Lee shows these books to the whole Confederate Congress. And he's like, see, gentlemen, the future shall judge us harshly. I think I'm going from, like, genteel to 
New York radio announcer now. They are so inspired by this knowledge that it sways many of their hearts, and they pass the anti-slavery bill. The end. Part two, the thesis. So I actually enjoyed this book on a superficial pulp fiction level. It's just this very well-researched book, and it works out pretty well as a piece of historical fiction if you can get past the really problematic thesis, and you shouldn't. Because the thesis is really problematic. That is the idea that the Confederacy were not the bad guys. And they aren't the bad guys in the guns of the South. Like, Turtle Dove clearly believes the House... Fuck. Like, Turtle Dove clearly believes the South had the right to secede. And, yes, they had slaves, but they, they were noble at heart and would have moved beyond slavery on their own. Like, there's this part where, after the war, school teacher Nathan is hired by this freed slave to teach him to do math so he can do bookkeeping. And there's an extended scene where he's trying to learn long division. And he only understands it when Nathan allows him to work it out for himself. Instead of just telling him what to do. And it's obviously a metaphor for Nathan's arc and the South in general. Like, there's this part where one of the Congress dudes reading the alternate history book says something like, It is no good thing to be condemned by one's own grandchildren in the future. Because people are so swayed by the opinions of their grandchildren. Even Nathan Bedford Forrest, when he learns the truth about the future and the neo-Nazis try to assassinate Robert E. Lee, he has a change of heart. And he's not like an abolitionist by the end, but one of the founding fathers of the Ku Klux Klan is on the road to redemption. It's just this absurdly sympathetic view that like, yeah, there are some neo-Nazi bad apples out there who, who pointedly are not even from the United States. And again, Harry Turtledove isn't some right-wing propaganda guy. He's just a pop fiction author from California with a PhD in, like, Byzantine history. And it just goes to show how mainstream this idea was, and in some ways still is, that we can compartmentalize the Confederate ethos from the slavery elements. And I should know, because here's part three. Part three, the part I'm embarrassed about. Okay, so... In high school, I went through a Confederate history phase. Oh, freaking A, here we go. So I'm a Southerner. Technically, both sides of my family are from Alabama. And I was a kid in small town Mississippi, a place called West Point. It's got like 8,000 people. And it's actually nice. It's not in the interstate, so it's managed to keep a lot of its small town charm. It's like if Stars Hollow from Gilmore Girls had an annual Civil War battle reenactment in like two barbecue restaurants per capita. I mean, maybe actually they did. I I don't know. But I'm pretty sure Stars Hollow didn't have a big old Confederate monument in the center of town maintained by the Daughters of the Confederacy. Anyway... That's where my people are from. They're from the South, and they weren't slave owners. They were subsistence farmers and lumberjacks. But still, I've got direct ancestors who died in Union prison camps. So there's that. And we moved to Denver, Colorado when I was 10. And so there I am, a few years later, a nerdy and hormonal teenager in Denver just trying to find out who I am. And I wanted to have a heritage. So I started to explore this idea that maybe the Confederacy weren't actually fighting for only slavery. And maybe the North wasn't actually fighting to free the slaves. After all, some Northern territories had slaves. And the Emancipation Proclamation didn't even free those people. And maybe the whole... Issue was just a lot more incidental than history made it out to me. And maybe, maybe it's not bad for awkward, insecure 15-year-old me to be proud of my southern roots. But the more I got into this, the more it started to unravel. Because what I began to realize is that it's possible for more than one thing to be true. So it can be true that the Confederacy and the Civil War weren't all about slavery, and that slavery didn't matter to a lot of rebel soldiers. But it can also be true... That slavery was a big part of the South. It was in their constitution. Like, that is a brute fact that owning people was just okay there. And that evil splashes onto everything else by association. It's like today when people protest to protect the Confederate statues and want to put up Confederate flags in NASCAR and Mississippi wants to have a battle flag in its flag and... And straight up KKK and neo-Nazis show up to those rallies. And I'm sure most of those protesters are just passionate about history and peaceful and whatever. But it's like if you are on the same side of the picket 
as the KKK, then I'm sorry, that's that's on you. When, when the KKK show up to, to my protest, that means I really need to reconsider my position or, or find a new place to protest. And that's what the Confederacy was. They might not have been all slaveholders, but they were on the same side of the fence. The point is that this Confederate sympathetic view used to be a lot more mainstream than it is today, but it didn't track back then, and it doesn't track today. Even Harry Turtle loves thesis. Uh, even if his thesis is true, that ending slavery gradually through due process would have been better for everyone. That's not a decision you get to make if you're the one who owns people. This is still a bunch of white men uh, written by a white author who are arguing about when it's best to stop owning people. So the conclusion to my personal teenage odyssey was me coming to terms with the fact that maybe a heritage is just something that I do not get to celebrate. And that's not fair, but it's also not unprecedented. I mean, you don't see the average German saying, Ja, Hitler is bad and the Third Reich is bad. But I mean, no, I mean, the Nazis are a stain on the history of Germany. And that's just what it is. And if they can deal with it, I can deal with it, and the South can deal with it too. But I don't want to just bash Southerners uh, who try to protect their statues here. I, I also want to give you an insight into where they're coming from. They're they're not all just ignorant racists. I mean, certainly many of them are ignorant racists. But consider that as late as 1992, when this book came out, this sort of thinking was perfectly accepted and held by many people that had no connection to the South. Uh, I mean, the Dukes of Hazard, a primetime TV show, they had the Confederate battle flag on their car. And I know that that was kind of a caricature, but still, like, they're still making light of it. And oh my God. And now you have people uh, who, after 150 years of it being kind of okay to take pride in parts of their history are being told that it is no longer even kind of okay. And it doesn't make it right or excusable, and their feelings are definitely not more valuable than the black Americans who have to look at those godforsaken statues every goddamn day. The, the statue should be taken down yesterday. But also, another thing can be true, and that's that maybe, maybe it's we shouldn't automatically shove a Confederate history sympathizer into the big old basket of deplorables. I mean, definitely some people. Part four, this could actually be good. I would love to see The Guns of the South adapted into a Netflix series. I think this could be really interesting and relevant in today's climate in, in 2020. You would just have to make some small but crucial tweaks. Like when you take an ugly girl's glasses off and oh my god, she's beautiful. Well, I'm going to take the ugly glasses off of a problematic book and I'm going to do it for no other reason than that I'm buzzed. And I want to hear myself talk some more. Number one, make it a dystopia. Or at least don't present the South winning as a good thing. Make it very clear that it was a plot by bad, evil time travelers and that the March of Progress was, without a doubt, sabotaged. Now, that doesn't mean we can't follow and pull for the same characters. It would just make Robert E. Lee more of a... Tyrion Lannister type, someone we pull for, even though he's obviously on the wrong side. In the book, Lee does become an abolitionist, but it's more of a reflection of the fundamental nobility of the southern man. But uh, all you would have to do to fix that is have Lee recognize this duality, to, to both love the South and see that there is a fundamental evil in his nation that they're not just going to grow out of. Number two, make Abraham Lincoln a protagonist. So in this book, Lincoln is a minor character. He only shows up for a few scenes, but Harry Turtledove obviously has tremendous respect for him and his noble intentions. But I think it would just be, just be, I think it would be just as cool to see his story from, I think it would be just as cool to see the story from his perspective. And uh, on that note, number three, add any black characters at all. The Guns of the South does have black people in it, but they're just devices to teach and educate the white people. I want to see their actual perspectives, like maybe a Union soldier uh, uh, or an escaped slave on the Underground Railroad, or, or maybe like 
The neo-Nazis have a mole in their ranks that manages to traffic a bunch of weapons to the Underground Railroad, and there is a guerrilla slave uprising, and we get to see the leaders of that and how that plays out. I mean, yeah, that, that's a lot to add. So here's number four. Make it longer. I guess we're beyond the just taking off the glasses phase and have gotten more into, like, plastic surgery. But there's a reason I'm pitching this as a multi-season Game of Thrones-style TV show, and it's because this story should be both deep and wide, which might be Turtle Love's fundamental problem. His premise is that the Civil War isn't this melodramatic Star Wars good guys and bad guys thing, which is why you can't tell this story with just two protagonists in 500 pages. Now, I, I did learn that Harry Turtle Love sort of agrees because he apparently wrote another alternate Civil War history where the South wins. This one has no AK-47s and no neo-Nazis. I... I, I I think it's like certain events early in the war transpired differently. Anyway, he's he, he's got like at least three or four books in this series. Somehow, I don't think it'll be any less problematic than The Guns of the South. And I'm not going to read them. I know that's not fair. I'm sorry. Uh, but if you take my idea at Netflix and do a series, do the one with time travel and AK-47s. Because that's just way more fun. That's all I got. Smash that like and subscribe.